You spoke about the Swachh Bharat Mission, the sanitation program that the government had rolled out four years ago. We've made a big progress as far as that is concerned and uh, the Gates Foundation sees a big opportunity there as far as the toilet project is concerned. Uh, run us through what's the current uh, state of that project in India right now, what are the pilots you are running and how exactly, you know, let's say in the next three to four years time frame do you anticipate this project to roll out? Okay. So again, there are two big elements there. One is first the prioritization of sanitation as a national mission. And there we really do think you know, this government's commitment to that is very laudable. There are not many governments in the world that have made sanitation a, sort of a priority in the way that Prime Minister Modi has. And we wish more governments would do that because it is such a critical issue. The rapid scale of urbanization taking place in India and mm. indeed many parts of the developing world means it's simply not going to be possible to put in place sort of traditional types of engineering, sewer lines, other forms of more traditional infrastructure and sanitation to keep pace with the range of people coming in. Right. So we're having to look for new kinds of models and one of the big evolutions of the last four years has been in so-called sort of fecal sludge management policies. Mm. We've helped work at both at national level and at a state level and we now have multiple states uh, that have introduced these and are uh, creating new fecal sludge management you know, units which are actually helping process at the state level and these include states from AP to Tamil Nadu, uh, UP has just put out a tender I think for 31 of these uh, that will service 53 cities. So these are very tangible moves forward into a hmm. different kind and model of how to approach sanitation which again we think is a model not just for India but for large parts of the developing world. Hmm. The other part which you're referring to is what we've been calling internally the Gates Foundation the so-called reinvented toilet. The toilet yeah. So uh, what Bill Gates, we recently hosted a big expo in China just a, a month or so ago which is tried right model saying the long-term future of sanitation has to be non-piped sanitation so not the traditional. So can you get cheap, effective new kinds of toilets that don't use water but that do meet all the basic needs we have and can we make them commercially viable at scale? What we have is some great prototypes hmm. we're testing out. We're in active discussions with commercial partners including a commercial partner here in India where we hope the test is we would license the technology to try and have them commercialize it at scale hmm. and then the hope is those models will be something that we'll be able to roll out in the coming years and yes India will be absolutely central to that. Bill Gates had said that the market could be as big as uh, six billion dollars in the next few years as far as the entire toilet project is concerned. Uh, how much of that do you think could be pushed by India? Well, obviously, we're optimistic that a great deal of it could be pushed in that way. Some of that will depend on the partnerships. You know, we would do, and this is the nature of how philanthropy works, we will help develop the prototypes which we've done. Mm. We will try and seek out the partners. Part of the commercialization agreements is we will have sort of mandatory links there that we want to make sure that there will be availability needs for the poorest. Uh, built in because that is our mandate uh, but then it's actually going to be on the take up on governments uh, being willing to sort of purchase and think about how you use these at scale. Our hope is you can do these in a phased way. They're first probably going to be most useful at community level toilets for schools or other communities where you are building multiple uh, mm. units and then will become more viable as units for individual household use. Uh, but again, this is the magic of when you can match the private sector against some of these new technologies for public good mm. and then you can have the government incentivize that through some programs and purchasing programs, uh, then very good things can happen. By when do you think the commercial production could actually start rolling out these toilets in India? Uh, well, it, it will depend a little bit on the process now. So again, our hope it could be as early as the next year or two. It could take three to four years. Again, uh, we started this conversation by saying we're impatient optimists, so we will hope for the more ambitious timeline. In general, our experience, these things often take a little longer than you hope, but right. you know, let's see where we go. How, how how strong is India positioned as far as achieving the 2030 sustainable goals are concerned, particularly on the, on the ones that Gates Foundation is focusing on? There, you know, India has seen massive progress, for example, in the uh, elimination of extreme poverty and the trends remain very positive and good and so if we can continue those, uh, there, India has a very good chance of meeting the SDG uh, for overall poverty reduction. Hmm. On health, again, there have been very significant improvements in reductions in child mortality and maternal mortality, 
in infectious diseases, actually in some of the diseases we work on like malaria where unfortunately there's been an upsurge in some other parts of the year after 15 years of steady decline, India is still showing progressive decline, I think in the order of 15% annually. Mm -hmm. So again, we think uh, India is on track to do that with the right investments. We're hopeful that some of the big schemes, actually there'll be a big conference here in Delhi that the Prime Minister will be at next week and helping open for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health, which is a global effort around maternal and child health issues. Right. And there uh, the government will showcase some of the work it's done under Mission Indranush, which has been a big push to get vaccines to everyone who needs them. But you know, in the last two to three years, we had seen multiple uh, uh, negative uh, discussions around funding, international funding coming into India. We had certain uh, politically uh, motivated groups targeting the vaccine program, targeting the Gates Foundation. Did the Gates Foundation work kind of feel the impact of that sort of a negative publicity that for some time was there in the last two to three years? And we had also seen the government being little slow as far as partnership with international funds is concerned. Was there an impact that the Gates Foundation had seen? Well, the Two issues, Ray. One is there are wider concerns, which again happen globally. Uh, fascinating. Seattle, where the Gates Foundation is headquartered, is one of the epicenters in the U.S. of a so-called anti-vaccination movement, where lots of parents don't want to vaccinate their children uh, because they're worried about all sorts of dangers. You know, from our perspective, we're a very science-based, open organization. We don't have anything to hide about what we do or how we do it. We think the evidence is extremely strong and in fact, pretty yeah. incontrovertible that mm. vaccines save lives. They are safe. They're treated. India has a very tough regulatory process to help check these. They're a global regulatory process the World Health Organization oversees. Then in terms of the resourcing and funding, that's where it actually, it's been very encouraging to see the Mission Indranush focus push it because that helped give a priority and a visibility into vaccines and the need to drive them forward. And then to your point about sort of the foreign versus the domestic, we've actually worked very closely with a number of domestic uh, manufacturers, including Bharat, including Bio, we are on domestic manufacturing of key vaccines like rotavirus, like measles, rubella, to help work in the Indian market. So the there wasn't any mortality. negative impact, is what you're saying, from the from the negative publicity around the, those. We discussions. haven't seen real negative impact at this stage, and you know, it's always a concern, and that's why I was using the example back to the United States. This this is a global set of concerns. Mm. You've seen measles outbreaks happening again in rich countries. Italy recently has had a set of measles outbreaks because there's been debates about you know measles vaccines. It's it's a horrible way to have a wake-up call, mm. but in a way it's a useful wake-up call. I think actually in countries like India and you know, other parts of the world that have more recent experience of just how terrible it can be when you don't have access to vaccination, the demand is there, the, you know, the commitment is there, and we hope that will continue. Uh, in India, uh, you know, the biggest issue right now that's plaguing the country is joblessness of the youth. Do you think, you know, while the goalkeeper's report put a very positive light on India and the way it has utilized its demogra demographic dividend, do you think India has really done that? India talks about having a youth boom. It has had a huge youth boom. It is nothing on the youth boom that is currently taking place in Africa. Hmm. You know, uh, on current trends, by 2050, one in three young people on the planet will be African. In the cases of China and India, which we cited there, you know, China obviously has made huge investments in human capital as seen some of the fastest reductions in poverty reduction ever recorded by any country over that period and also similar improvements in health uh, and education and other indicators. India is in the middle of that and India, you know, again, the signs are relatively positive in terms of how the government has been trying to prioritize these investments, uh, putting in those, that, that sort of human capital framework I'm talking about. Mm. That is not the same as saying we think everything is great and okay and if you just leave it, India is already a model of you know, how to do this. There's absolutely this continued challenge at every level, not just you talk about the issue of, sort of jobless youth today, uh, which I'll come back to, but it really starts with, you know, again, the young and newborns who are going to be the youth of tomorrow. We actually, the, a different project we're doing at the Gates Foundation right now that Melinda Gates is, is helping lead along with the finance minister of Indonesia and a very interesting African telecoms billionaire is a group we call Pathways for Prosperity, mm. which is a group we've pulled together, Melinda Gates has helped pull together to say actually innovation can and should be our friend in terms of providing these kind of opportunities. The, the leapfrogging that we're undergoing in the financial inclusion space, even in some spaces like sort of agriculture, are actually looked at correctly is the way to provide opportunities for those young people. What are those other equivalents? You know, there must be many more that, out there. But do you see these equivalents in India? Because um, uh, whether, while there has been not much uh, 
growth as far as job creation in industries is concerned. And you're saying that's just one part of it. Well, we're big billions. Do you think India has really missed the bus as far as, you know, no, I definitely taking don't think advantage Malaysia. of the demographic no, dividend? No, no, no. We think India is one of the most powerful homes of innovation there are. There are, you know, more talented young people with the skills and the knowledge and the energy. I think it's about trying to provide the opportunities to unlock for them. Now, those are not things necessarily we as the Gates Foundation will do. Again, our mandate is always to focus on the needs of the very poorest. That's our mission as a foundation. That takes you down a very specific set of interventions. But at the same time, part of the reason you know, Melinda is hosting the events is we think we can have a role just helping encourage a more optimistic discussion debate about what are the ways in which we can unlock these things. It's probably not going to be a sort of top-down instructive ways. You know, if we have this interview five years from now, my guess is that we're going to have discovered half a dozen fascinating things that young Indians have done that are actually models for the rest of the world and India in terms of that. And so that's, that's what we're looking for. Right. Just as I end this uh, uh, interview, one biggest challenge that you think India still needs to deal with and if not uh, you know, addressed, uh, sustainable development goals are really not achievable. Let me answer it with one that you know, is, is one that is the foundation we think is a platform uh, that without which we're unlikely to meet all of the goals. And it's one that India is you know, uh, grappling with in a very real fashion, as many other parts of the, the world are, which is the SDG 5, which is the gender goal. Uh, which has a critical set of targets about the role of you know, women in the economy, about you know, access to you know, equal financial services, legal rights of land tenure, issues of child marriage. You know, it's, it's a very comprehensive set of goals in itself, which we think are critically important. Mm -hmm. And you know, many, if not most of those, are formal policies of the government of India to help implement. But it's also, if we don't make progress on that as a globe, as a world, you simply won't meet, you know, women are a disproportionate amount of smallholder farm labor. In India, there are almost two-thirds of the labor on farms that are dealing with issues like livestock. You simply are not going to meet an agricultural productivity and an agricultural income goal if you aren't focusing on the specific needs of women. Hmm. And you simply won't meet a poverty reduction goal if you're not focusing on agricultural productivity because so many of the poor remain rural poor. Hmm. So you can follow the connection. You won't meet the health goals unless you're focusing on the specific needs of mothers and children around sort of nutrition, access to family planning, other key indicators. So, you know, I wouldn't say that that's the one big thing. I think for us, we think that's something that the world has actually not focused on as much as they should have. That's why the, the original Millennium Development Goals did not have as strong a focus on gender as they should have had. There was a, a gender goal, but it had much less robust targets. We think this is really you know, a huge opportunity. And again, India is absolutely tackling these issues head on. But like the rest of the world, if you don't succeed in meeting those gender goals, you will not succeed in meeting the other goals. So putting the gender lens as far as any development of, uh, activity is concerned. Well, Mr. Suzman, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Great. Thank you so much for having me.